efficacy and effectiveness of their funds in a project, which influences our current and future uh, funding plans. Two, M&E improves our project performance. We say um, what cannot be measured does not exist. A well planned uh, M&E plan helps the project team to better understanding of uh, uh, the target population's needs. This helps to define the scope of the project and design objectives that are relevant, measurable, and achievable. You know a bit about uh, 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 smart objectives. A well defined uh, M&E plans also clarifies the process and interventions that to lead to the project's uh, outputs and uh, deliverables. M&E helps the team to plan and uh, plan to end indicator management system identifies uh, effective tools and methodologies to measure, analyze, and demonstrate every intervention and its impact on uh, expected outcomes. The other point is that M&E aids in effective resource allocation. Uh, all project operations are interwoven around project budgets. The amount of deliverable cash, uh, available cash depends uh, on the duration and the magnitude of the interventions choices of resources, and the, number, and the number of employees to be employed uh, in the project. It will be hard to budget if you don't know uh, what the plan is for the implementation of the project. M&E facilities with the estimation of the value work and the impact of the project components and enables to team, the team to verify what works and what doesn't work and where money should be invested and where budget should be cut. M&E allows the team to make appropriate changes to the financial plan on a regular basis to avoid unfavorable contingencies. Number four, M&E provides learning and database-based uh, database, uh, decision-making. Uh, we say numbers uh, don't lie, and so M&E helps in uh, finding those numbers. M&E data provides quantifiable results to help the involved parties to learn the project successes and challenges and be more adaptive and be more adaptive. Involved parties are better prepared to respond to over, over, um, ever evolving project situations, determine what works and what does not work, and why it did not work, and how it could be improved and make revisions based on data, evidence, rather than assumptions. Five, M&E helps in systematic uh, management of an organization. Um, monitoring and evaluation uh, as a function helps uh, in performance management tool as it facilitates organizations to gather, disseminate, and utilize information and data to improve uh, the internal operations and add value to the organizations. Organizations can thus focus on the objectives such as enhancing performance and encouraging innovations. Benefits of taking a uh, M&E uh, course. Um, monitoring and evaluation course is one of the most marketable profession in development work. Uh, some of the benefits are by having an M&E training you have higher chances of uh, getting a job within uh, an NGO or development organization. Um, you have higher chances for job promotion if you are already working in an organization. And most people working in uh, project management uh, move on to uh, monitoring and evaluation as a NATO specialization. An M&E officer has skills to measure NGO performance and the difference the NGO or a government body or the UN body is making in a given a community. Monitoring and evaluation, consultancies are highly paying uh, for those who would like to go into that area. I would now like to invite uh, Mr. Stephen Mushami uh, to take us through the introduction to monitoring and evaluation course. Thereafter, we will have questions and answers. Uh, Ms. Irene Otieno from uh, Capacity Africa will then take you through the processes of how our courses are delivered up to the graduation. Thank you very much and welcome to this webinar. Irene, Steve, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Okay. okay, please go ahead, Stephen. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, if you can enable me to share my screen. Yes.
Hello. Okay, so uh, so I am sure my screen can be viewable now, and uh, uh, let me just uh, have the screen uh, come up. And uh, yeah, so I think this is uh, uh, this is uh, what I wanted you to be able to view, and um, I'm sure you can uh, you can actually be able to view that uh, from uh, from uh, from the screens as well. And um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Moshiri, for just being able to take us through uh, about the whole uh, uh, introduction uh, into m and &E, and that you've been able to highlight uh, quite a number of points as why uh, m and &E really, really becomes important uh, for development and humanitarian practitioners. And I just wanted to pick over uh, from there and um, basically just be able to uh, uh, move in a bit of a structured approach uh, according to the uh, according to the agenda that we had for uh, for today's session. Uh, so basically, just be able to look at um, uh, exactly uh, what we needed to understand uh, regarding uh, some of these things that we were able to itemize uh, in uh, uh, in our agenda. And so, for uh, for those of you who um, may not uh, uh, be able to remember, these are some of the things that we wanted to be able to look at. And so, we want to move in a very structured approach, uh, be able to cover these nine items. Um, 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 uh, there, there's a lot of content um, uh, in some of these areas, and uh, we'll try as much as possible because what we want to achieve at the end of this webinar. Uh, is for you to be able to have a proper understanding of some of these concepts that sometimes give uh, development and humanitarian practitioners um, 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 a lack of clarity uh, in being able to understand some of these concepts um, as effectively as possible. And so uh, what we will do, uh, because um, um, I've been a practicing consultant uh, for the last 20 years, and um, as you move through different organizations, you will always realize that people are not able to um, articulate uh, some of these concepts for m and &E, uh, quite, quite clearly. And that's why uh, we want to be able to uh, see if we can be able to articulate uh, some of these concepts um, as, as clearly as possible and as comprehensively as possible so that we can have a very good understanding. And then at the end of presentation, uh, we will be able to take a round of questions, clarifications that you may have. Uh, in some of these areas, and that's what we'll be doing uh, towards the end um, uh, of this presentation. So, uh, so as we go through the different sections, uh, please just pick on your uh, questions, your comments, uh, just uh, uh, be able to have them somewhere, and we will be able to take some round of uh, some questions and some feedback uh, regarding the presentation. So, um, as I've been introduced, my name is Steven uh, Mochami. I will be the session moderator as we look through these different um, uh, uh, sections. And um, as I've just uh, been able to reiterate, uh, just um, uh, note your questions and uh, we will be able to have a round of um, uh, question and answer uh, feedback session uh, towards the end of my presentation. So just um, allow us uh, for just about um, maybe one hour, 15 minutes or one hour and a half uh, just to be able to uh, run through some of these concepts and make sure we can clarify them uh, so that you're able to work on these concepts uh, uh, very easily with um, uh, with a lot of clarity of what actually uh, they represent in m and &E. So that's basically what we want to do. And I'm sure you will be able to appreciate um, uh, a lot of these uh, concepts as, um, as we go through them. Uh, so let me just begin. Uh, so let me just begin and just um, look at the first uh, uh, thing, uh, which is simply just uh, to agree that these are the session objectives that we have, uh, about 10 objectives uh, over this session, just to be able to see how we can quickly be able to move uh, through these uh, important items as much as possible. And um, uh, we will be able to go through this and ensure that um, we are able to um, achieve this uh, at the end of the session. What we are trying to do is to make sure that uh, we can use this session uh, to just give you a very comprehensive um, m and &E, uh, introduction uh, such that you can come out of here and come out with a lot of confidence uh, regarding the area of m and &E, and you might want to be able to pursue uh, some of the uh, in-depth courses that we offer on the subject 
uh, which um, uh, Irene will be giving us details uh, at the end of this particular session. So let's just be able to uh, start with some introduction into some ME uh, terms and concepts. And the first thing I want to be able to start with uh, this particular um, uh, time is to ensure that um, I can clarify what is monitoring and evaluation, because I think uh, a lot of the times we are not able to uh, really understand exactly what do we mean uh, with monitoring and evaluation. Or sometimes we understand, but we are not clear about the difference between monitoring and evaluation. So sometimes we, uh, we could actually be able to see uh, those kind of challenges where um, uh, it's probably we don't really understand the difference between the two, uh, but maybe we have a fair understanding of what uh, is monitoring and evaluation, but um, we do not really understand that there's a clear difference between the two uh, terminologies as well. Uh, so the first thing that I would want to do is to just uh, make it clear um, that monitoring uh, is all about uh, the continuum and uh, systematic uh, collection of data. And uh, this is basically uh, what we are able to do, uh, basically uh, ensuring that um, we can be able to uh, understand uh, uh, exactly uh, when you talk about uh, being able to uh, collect data. And uh, that's basically what we are able to do uh, when it comes to uh, to monitoring uh, and, and, and evaluation. So, uh, so this is something that um, uh, we actually need to be able to uh, understand as much as possible and um, ensure that um, uh, we are able to uh, uh, understand um, uh, that monitoring uh, basically involves uh, that continuous and systematic collection of some data that should be able to provide you information about uh, project progress. This is very, very different from evaluation uh, because if you look at the evaluation and you'll see some of the key highlighted words that I've used there, uh, is that in evaluation now we talk about periodic and very systematic assessment. Uh, of the project design, uh, project implementation, and also project results uh, for an ongoing or completed uh, uh, project. So, so here we are simply just focusing on uh, being able to uh, gather uh, information in a periodic basis and in a very systematic way uh, so that we can be able to assess the project in terms of not just the progress, uh, but the design and the implementation and also the results uh, of either an ongoing or a completed project. So, so that's uh, basically what we do um, uh, when it comes to evaluation. And, and there, there are very, very clear fundamental differences. And, um, um, and um, uh, when it comes to evaluation, uh, there are clear uh, specific things that we should be able to answer. Um, uh, it is important to make sure that we are able to address uh, quite a number of things and uh, we should be able to um, uh, specifically, uh, when you talk about evaluation, uh, we should be able to be very clear, clear about relevance. Uh, did that project actually address the needs um, uh, of the beneficiaries or the needs of what uh, the project was intended to be able to address? And that becomes a critical question to be able to answer. Uh, secondly, also we'll be looking at efficiency, uh, whether uh, were the resources of the project actually used uh, very, very wisely. And so there we'll be looking at um, efficiency. Then again, also effectiveness. Um, uh, the, uh, did the project actually um, achieve the desired results? Uh, that's another thing that um, every uh, ME person would want to be able to see at the end of the project. And again, also, we would also want to be able to see uh, on the impact uh, where we want to clearly address to what extent have the project activities been able to bring about changes uh, for the betterment uh, of the individual or of the community and that becomes very very important and also uh, we have the issue of sustainability uh, where we are looking into uh, will the project change be able to last beyond the project initiatives and so uh, some of those um, criticalities become very very important uh, to be able to address when it comes to uh, an evaluation. So it's very, very important uh, to be able to understand that. Now, let me just move a little bit further. Uh, I've just uh, been able to define what is ME. Uh, but as most of you are aware, uh, nowadays we are not just talking about ME, but we are also talking about MIL. And so it is important now that we're able to understand why are we um, uh, talking about MIL? Why is MIL actually becoming uh, also essential 
uh, in terms of being able to understand that because um, uh, in most projects nowadays, um, um, uh, the term that you will hear is meal, and um, unlike in the past where we used to hear more about m &E. So it is important to bring uh, to our attention what exactly do we mean uh, when we are able to talk about meal. So meal, uh, meal is basically a new concept and is very, very critical to the success of all projects. And um, meal definitely will be able to help uh, individuals and teams working in projects uh, to ensure that they are accountable uh, to stakeholders uh, through information sharing. And that's why we emphasize the importance of having meal uh, in a project um, uh, as a project is being implemented. Again, also, a meal is also very, very helpful in terms of ensuring that we're able to develop uh, what we call a complaints and a feedback mechanism. Uh, that basically helps us to be able to guide the project implementation. And so that really uh, becomes uh, quite, quite critical uh, to be able to address uh, as well. And then again, uh, meal processes normally strengthen accountability and learning. And I just want to double click those words, accountability and learning, because uh, it is one of the things that I just want to be able to um, uh, especially uh, emphasize when it comes to meal. And so, uh, so they're able to strengthen accountability, they're able to strengthen learning, and also ensure that we're able to promote the project program uh, or portfolio effectiveness. And most of you uh, who have some good understanding of project management is that you know at the smallest uh, unit of our interventions, we will have projects and then the hierarchy goes higher into program. And again, also um, uh, when we have a collection of programs, then we are able also to have what we call a portfolio. And that's why we're talking about it is very, very helpful in ensuring that we can promote the project program and portfolio uh, effectiveness as, as expected. So it's always good to keep in mind uh, about that. And uh, the other thing, uh, is also the issue of accountability. Uh, accountability becomes very, very important uh, as well uh, because um, accountability is basically the commitment uh, to make sure that we can transparently uh, be able to respond uh, to the needs of all stakeholders. And um, here we are talking about, um, uh, when you talk about uh, uh, stakeholders, we are talking about beneficiaries, uh, that is the donors, the partners, and the project organization uh, regarding the project activities as, as expected. And again, also the component of learning, uh, where we're talking about the need to be able to have processes in place and a culture that basically enables internal, uh, intentional reflection uh, that allows us to be able to learn so that we can make better decisions in the future, or we can also be able to make um, uh, smart future decisions um, as we are emphasizing. So, so it's very, very important uh, to be able to uh, uh, understand these two uh, additional components. So you can see, if you just define monitoring and evaluation and basically just do that, then you will be missing um, a very important um, uh, 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 component as well, uh, which is that of accountability and learning. And that is why now MIL is taking preeminence uh, over M&E uh, alone. So in most programs, in most projects that you will go into, uh, they will be able to say uh, they have been able to implement meal processes as expected. And that's what uh, basically means. So you can see, uh, in addition to monitoring and evaluation that covers the M and N E, uh, we are able to, to add um, accountability and learning uh, by adding the A and L, and that's what makes up uh, meal. And so it's becoming a very, very common practice and um, I just want us to be able to delve a little bit further and say now, when you talk about accountability, what therefore should projects do to ensure that um, accountability is actually entrenched uh, in projects, in programs, and in portfolios? What should, pro um, um, uh, what should organizations be able to do uh, in their meal processes? And then again also, it is also important to emphasize then what organizations uh, uh, should, should they be able to do uh, in their meal processes uh, to make sure that they are able to enhance learning as well. So it's important uh, to be able to consider that as well. Now, um, uh, so let's just uh, be able to uh, be able to move into this and um, uh, be able to emphasize uh, why this uh, becomes um, uh, very, very important uh, to be able to address and say that um, uh, it is important for us to be able to consider uh, some of the things that um, uh, we actually 
uh, need to be able to understand uh, when it comes to the issue of um, uh, accountability as well. So, uh, so it is important uh, to make sure that um, uh, we can be able to address uh, some of these things as, as, as much as possible. So, uh, so it's important uh, to make sure uh, that um, we are able to uh, understand um, uh, 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 understand some of those things uh, as much as possible. Uh, so let me just uh, be able to say that um, projects will basically embrace accountability by promoting one. Uh, we need to make sure that projects have transparent uh, communications, ensuring that we can share our uh, information with communities, partners, donors, uh, and other stakeholders. And so it's important to make sure that um, uh, we can actually be able to do that uh, as much as possible. And so it's important uh, to allow uh, some of those things to uh, ensure that uh, we are able to uh, understand some of those things as, as much as possible. So, uh, so it's very, very critical uh, to ensure that um, we can actually be able to do that. Again, also, uh, it is important to make sure that um, um, uh, that projects are actually aligned with standards and that's why uh, MIL is able to enhance accountability by ensuring that um, we are able to align the project uh, with um, the agreed donor requirements and also with MIL uh, best practices. Again, also accountability comes in uh, in ensuring that we are responsive and you remember earlier on I spoke about um, the whole issue of um, uh, the whole issue of, of ensuring that you have a feedback and a complaint mechanism uh, to be able to get feedback uh, from, uh, from the project. And so ensuring that we can be able to uh, have channels through which stakeholders can voice their feedback uh, really works well uh, for the project as much as possible. And then again, also the issue of participation uh, also becomes important where we can encourage varying degrees of contributions uh, from different uh, stakeholders and uh, this really becomes important. And participation is a key thing, is a key thing. Nowadays, you will not do a project and you leave um, uh, the key stakeholders of a project outside. You are likely to end up with a very uh, unsuccessful project and you don't always want to have that. And that's why you should be able to promote accountability by uh, enhancing um, uh, transparent communication, alignment with um, uh, best standards, uh, also responsiveness and also participation as well. What about learning? What about learning? What can projects be able to do uh, to make sure they embrace learning uh, so that the meal processes are effective? Now, one of the things that we can ensure that learning uh, actually takes place uh, is to ensure that we can in incentivize learning uh, that is ensuring that we're able to frame all project work as a learning opportunity uh, so that we can encourage modeling and also rewarding learning. So when projects are able to learn uh, from what was done, then we can be able to ensure that we're able to recognize that and be able to reward that as well. Uh, again, also encouraging a spirit of curiosity uh, is very, very important. Uh, that is um, allowing uh, the team or the project stakeholders to ask questions, to be curious, uh, to be able to challenge assumptions uh, so that we can encourage a spirit of learning um, uh, as we do our meal uh, processes. So it's very, very important to ensure that that uh, can actually be entrenched. Then the other thing uh, that also becomes important is to ensure that we can embed learning processes uh, that may ensure us that um, uh, we are able to have concrete learning elements uh, such as the use of checklists uh, to be able to promote uh, to prompt learning and also ensuring that uh, we have learning questions in meeting agendas uh, it actually becomes very very important to be able to do that and again there is um, of course learning uh, allows us to be able to promote um, the whole issue of adaptive management. Uh, that is, we are able to analyze monitoring and evaluation data uh, promptly and frequently. And we are also able to actively seek to understand project data and also using the evidence uh, to inform our decisions uh, regarding the adjustments that we should be able to make in project design, planning and implementation. And adaptive management is becoming a, a, a critical um, um, a critical uh, aspect uh, in MIL where we want to make sure that MIL can allow us to be able to adapt uh, in our management processes as much as possible. So as we make 
um, adjustments to project design and planning uh, is based on what we are learning about some of those projects as expected. Then lastly, uh, we embrace learning by promoting sharing of information and it is always good to make sure that we're able to use project learning uh, to make sure that we can inform uh, organization and sectoral uh, best practices as expected. So it's always good to make sure uh, that we can understand that. Then there's another important concept that we want to bring into your attention, and I'm sure uh, most of you who are practitioners are aware of this, uh, but I just want to highlight this, and um, uh, I'll just, uh, just want to put you some, some definitions for you. I uh, will not go into it in details, but I just wanted to make sure that we have a very good understanding. And this is what we call monitoring and evaluation results levels. And this should be very, very clear in our minds uh, when you talk about because results in m and &E, uh, will always be defined based on these levels that we are outlining here. And I'll, I'll just show you a simple example, and I'm sure you will be able to uh, relook at that example again once you get um, a copy of this presentation. Uh, so that um, you are able to understand exactly uh, what we mean when you talk about the different uh, results levels that we consider uh, in m &E. So when you talk about inputs, uh, we are talking about um, uh, what are some of the resources that um, have been invested in the project or program. And a um, good example of that is like, um, have you had some technical assistance or computers that have been uh, provided or some mosquito nets that uh, will be distributed or some training that will be done? And um, again, also, when you look at the processes or activities, uh, some people call it processes, uh, but we also call it activities. Uh, these are basically the activities that we are going to carry out to make sure that the project can, uh, or the program can achieve its objectives as expected. And then when we talk about outputs, we are talking about uh, what are those immediate results uh, after you execute or after you implement activities uh, in the project or program. And so it's important to be able to notice that. And again, also, what are some of the outcomes? Um, and this is basically uh, uh, short-term or intermediate results. Uh, I think that's one of the uh, key words to be able to note uh, about uh, this kind of result, which we define as an outcome, the short-term or intermediate results uh, that are actually achieved um, after the execution of activities uh, in at the population level. And then finally, uh, the final result level is what we call impact. And in some situations, uh, people also call it the goal. Uh, so you can call it the goal uh, or the impact. Uh, it's simply uh, basically your long-term effects or the end results uh, of the project or program uh, that basically uh, allows us to be able to uh, um, uh, realize uh, the long-term results of the project or the end results of the project. And a good example is like when you talk about the changes in health status, uh, such as mortality, mobility, fertility, etc. And uh, it is important to be able to uh, understand uh, those um, uh, uh, four, um, uh, five, those five different uh, results levels as expected. Now, there's a good example here, and I'll just uh, share with you this example that you can easily keep in your mind uh, to be able to uh, just identify uh, clearly the results levels in m &E. And as you can see, uh, when you talk about inputs here, we are talking about do we have staff, do we have training materials, then after that you conduct a training event, then the key output or the immediate results is that the providers get trained in new clinical techniques, what is the outcome, this increase in the number of clients served by the providers, and then what is the impact is declining morbidity levels uh, in the target population. So this is just a simple example, uh, just to make sure uh, that does not confuse you again in the future and uh, uh, you become very clear uh, of what to be able to expect. And then um, here we have a summary of the key differences between monitoring and evaluation because we said uh, these two terms are different. Um, and so it is important to always be able to uh, understand the differences. So one is what we already highlighted. We said uh, monitoring is that continuous assessment uh, but now evaluation is that periodic assessment. And that is one of the key differences. Monitoring uh, focuses on activities and outputs, uh, whereas um, evaluation mainly focuses on outcomes and impacts uh, of the project. And then again, also uh, monitoring focuses on comparing um, uh, what is delivered against what was planned 
uh, we address um, evaluation focuses on project achievements. Uh, that is the positive, the negative, the intended or the unintended uh, um, um, uh, uh, achievements and recommendations and lessons learned from, from the project. And then uh, monitoring, uh, most of the times it's uh, done internally, uh, whereas as we know, evaluation is normally done externally uh, using an independent um, uh, consultant or an independent outsider uh, who will be able to give us an objective evaluation of what has happened uh, in the project. So, uh, so let's just keep that in mind uh, on the key differences between um, monitoring and evaluation. And it is important to be able to highlight that. Uh, so uh, in regards to the need for m and &E in development uh, projects, and not just in development projects, but also in humanitarian projects, uh, there's need for that. And uh, one of the, uh, some of these um, have been um, uh, uh, highlighted by Mr. Moshiri uh, earlier on, uh, where we talked about um, uh, it is important always to ensure that we have um, a ways of systematically measuring and assessing uh, program uh, or project activities uh, so as to check on the progress uh, of the. So, so I think uh, there's some in the background uh, making some noise. We can mute. Uh, or that person can just mute uh, to make sure we don't have background noise. Then the other thing, uh, it also helps determine uh, when a program is going to plan and when changes may actually um, uh, be needed. And also it forms the basis for modification of interventions or assessing the quality of the project activities that are actually being conducted. And it gives us a very good basis for that. Again, also it provides the necessary data uh, to be able to guide planning, uh, to also be able to guide us on how to allocate resources, uh, how to design and implement programs and projects, and if necessary, how to reallocate resources in better ways. So it's very, very helpful uh, in that. Again, it also provides um, uh, project planners, uh, project implementers, policy makers, donors, uh, with information and understanding uh, that they actually need to be able to make informed decisions about the operation of their programs and projects. And so you can see, uh, if you have a project and you actually miss to be able to have uh, m and &E in place, then uh, you will actually be missing uh, quite a lot of uh, 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 information that should help you in terms of making uh, very good decisions. So, uh, so it is important. Uh, for us to be able to look at that. Now, uh, the other thing is um, like we want to pick exactly, we just want to pick monitoring, um, just pick monitoring uh, out of uh, uh, the other components and, and, and kind of like just try to emphasize why monitoring is important because uh, if a project does not really address uh, the monitoring needs and the monitoring uh, specifications that are actually needed, uh, one of the things that you realize is that even evaluation will not become useful. So evaluation actually builds on the fact that we have had monitoring efforts uh, uh, being put in place as, as much as possible. And so uh, that is why we are emphasizing that monitoring is an important part of the project um, uh, cycle. And uh, project monitoring uh, definitely helps us to be able to monitor three key things. And one is whether we are implementing the project as planned. Uh, so uh, if we want to know whether the project is being implemented um, as planned, uh, then we need to be able to invest in monitoring. Uh, if we also need to be able to know whether we are achieving the planned results, uh, it is important also to understand about monitoring. And also when we want to be able to understand whether adjustments need to be made in the project, then um, we can also be able to understand that as much as possible. And so that's why we are saying that monitoring, therefore, uh, happens across two major levels. Uh, there are two major levels in which uh, monitoring uh, is able to happen. And um, I just want to be able also to show you a graphic on that. And as you can see, um, uh, so the uh, two critical areas uh, where monitoring actually happens uh, is um, uh, when we are doing implementation, uh, where we are able to monitor the implementation uh, of conversion of inputs to activities. And then again also, when we are also um, um, achieving results, that is when we are delivering our outputs, outcomes and impacts, then we also do what we call results monitoring because we have to always ensure that results monitoring is actually happening. And then again, still, 
um, um, uh, not uh, a critical uh, level, but then again, there is also what we call situation monitoring because you remember a project is working in a particular context. So we are also monitoring the situation, um, particularly in, in projects that you will be able to implement in areas that are uh, conflict are affected. And so you will be monitoring closely uh, the situation as, as things are able to happen. And so uh, it's very, very critical uh, to make sure that monitoring is entrenched because even evaluation, uh, relies on 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 on, on credible uh, information you're able to get during um, uh, implementation monitoring and also uh, through results uh, monitoring uh, as expected. So it's good uh, to be able to uh, to be able to highlight that uh, in in a very uh, in a very clear way. Then the other thing that um, we might also need to be able to emphasize as well. Uh, it is also good to. Uh, find um, how we might be able to emphasize um, uh, this as well, uh, is the issue of the types of indicators and ensuring that um, we can also identify outcome indicators um, as we look at the different uh, types of indicators. So it's good to be able to understand that. But just before I look at the different types of indicators and how we can be able to identify outcome indicators, uh, one of the things that I just want to be able to do is, first of all, um, if I just define what we define as an indicator, and then again also ensure that um, I can look at the types of indicators, then you can see what we are talking about when we are talking about outcome indicators. And so it's important uh, to make sure that we are able to uh, address that uh, very, very clearly. And so uh, in, in a simple manner, uh, we can say that um, an ME indicator uh, is actually a variable, and so uh, this is something that you always have to keep in in, in your mind. That um, uh, yeah, and when you talk about an indicator, it's a variable. It's a variable, and any time you 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 identify something as a variable, it means it has a value that should actually be able to change, and so this variable should actually tell you that something has changed. And remember, in monitoring and evaluation, having a variable is important because remember, we are adding inputs into a particular project. We are putting a certain intervention into a particular project. And so we are so keen to ensure that we want to see whether there is change. So one of the very important uh, things that we, we will try to measure uh, in a project is whether there has been change. Uh, in a project, and so for you to be able to uh, for you to be able to feel uh, that there's actually been change uh, in the project, uh, it is always good that um, uh, you are able to see um, at the change in 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 a value, and that is why we emphasize uh, that uh, um, uh, very uh, in a very uh, critical way that um, the, the ME indicator uh, will therefore be a variable. It's a variable that you expect that um, it will be able to show you change if that change actually happens. And so that variable basically is able to measure some key aspects or key elements uh, of a program or project, uh, such as um, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impacts. And it can tell that um, uh, out of this output, uh, there's actually some change that has actually been able to happen. Out of this outcome, there's a change that has actually uh, been able to happen. And out of this impact, uh, there's a change that has actually been able to happen. And that's why we are emphasizing uh, the whole importance of um, an m &E indicator as a variable uh, whose value uh, is able to change and um, who uh, one that can be able to measure uh, the key uh, aspects uh, and elements of a project or program uh, as expected. And so the purpose of indicators, uh, if you are to say why indicators are important, uh, then definitely this is one of the things that you will be able to highlight about indicators. Uh, one of the things is to be able to uh, show whether the program or project aspects or elements uh, were actually carried out as planned. Uh, so that is one of the things that we want to be able to achieve, uh, ensuring that we can be able to show uh, that this program uh, or project 
uh, aspects uh, or elements uh, has actually been carried out as planned and so it is important to be able to address that and then again also uh, another critical thing that we are able also to address uh, is to be able to show if a program or project actually was able to cause a change or a difference and that's something that um, we always want to be able to know that's why we will not implement a project and um, uh, we uh, fail to identify whether that project or uh, program has been able to bring a change and that's why you understand nowadays um, uh, uh, in most uh, project efforts people are talking about the, the, the theory of change so uh, people have to be able to document uh, what is uh, what is the theory of change for this particular project intervention that we are doing because it is important therefore to be able to understand whether our project or program intervention was able to cause a change uh, or a difference uh, uh, in the lives of people. So, uh, so those are the two key main purposes uh, of indicators. And uh, therefore, one of the things that we can actually be able to agree is that uh, for sure, an indicator is reasonably expected to vary uh, after uh, an intervention has actually been done. So once uh, you have been able to do uh, a particular intervention, uh, then we expect that uh, the indicator uh, should actually uh, should actually be able to vary and, and, and that really becomes uh, something that's very very critical to be able to emphasize so uh, so it's always good uh, to ensure that um, you can actually be able to uh, highlight uh, that variance and then the other thing that is important also to be able to mention uh, is that um, uh, the value uh, of this uh, indicator uh, should actually be able to change uh, from a given or a certain baseline level, uh, such as the program uh, or the project start, uh, to another value, uh, that is um, uh, at the uh, program uh, or project end, uh, when the indicator is actually measured and calculated again. And so it is important to make sure that um, uh, we can ensure uh, that the value uh, is actually uh, able to be uh, is actually able to change from a certain baseline level. And that's why in indicators, uh, we will also be able to identify a baseline uh, indicator uh, so that um, we expect after the project uh, uh, or program start, that is after the in intervention has been implemented, uh, this will actually be able to change to another value uh, at the program or project end uh, when the indicator is actually measured and calculated again and um, there we are able to have what you call uh, an actual indicator uh, after after the intervention has actually been able to take place and that becomes uh, very very critical uh, to be able to uh, to be able to address um, uh, that when we are working with indicators that's why you will go uh, to many professionals and you'll find they want to assess what are the baseline indicators uh, for their intervention uh, so that at some point they will also be able during m and &E planning then we can come up with what we call target indicators and then uh, once we are able to actually uh, do our evaluation then we can determine what are the actual uh, indicators uh, or indicator values uh, that we actually have and that will tell us whether there has been a significant change uh, in in that particular project or program and so it's important to be able to know that so let me just um, now uh, further go uh, 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 deeper into the different types of indicators uh, because um, um, that is the bit of intro that I wanted to uh, uh, ensure that you're able to understand exactly what do we mean when we talk about uh, indicators and um, um, uh, there's much more that we, um, uh, we address uh, in the course regarding the indicators and um, I'm sure most of you will be able to uh, come into the course and uh, we will be able to uh, understand some of the uh, deeper dimensions about uh, indicators as well as we look into indicators. Uh, again also, um, uh, it is important uh, to be able to, um, uh, to, be able to uh, address that and ensure that um, uh, we, can, uh, we can make sure uh, we are able to understand uh, the different uh, uh, types of uh, uh, of indicators that we need to uh, we need to be able to uh, we need to be able to deal with uh, as much as as possible. So, uh, so it is important uh, to make sure that um, 
uh, we can actually uh, be able to see uh, to be able to see that as 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 much as as possible. So uh, so it is important uh, to ensure that um, uh, we can be able to uh, understand those different types of uh, of indicators uh, as much as possible. So uh, so let me just uh, be able to. Uh, move to the different types of indicators that we actually have. Uh, just give me a moment. I just move into the different types of indicators uh, that we actually uh, need to be able to understand. And um, uh, it is important uh, that we are able to understand that uh, as much as possible uh, so that we are very clear uh, of exactly um, uh, what are the outcome uh, indicators uh, as expected. So, uh, so let me just be able to uh, show you this. So, uh, so, so a project or a, a program manager uh, um, uh, leaning towards uh, understanding m &E must be able to fully grasp uh, the fundamental difference um, uh, basically between uh, what you call process and uh, result indicators. Uh, so it's always good to make sure uh, that, uh, uh, that you're able to understand uh, the project, uh, uh, you're able to understand uh, the, 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 the fundamental differences between these different types of indicators and uh, we'll be able to uh, differentiate. Um, um, uh, it will be very, very important to be able to, uh, to differentiate um, uh, the different uh, uh, being able to understand the difference uh, uh, between uh, process and results uh, indicators as, as expected. Uh, so, uh, so when you look at um, the difference between process and results indicators, uh, I know most of you from just that you can actually be able to tell. You can tell that the process indicators are basically dealing with uh, the, uh, the, the activities and the outputs uh, of the project and also the results indicators will be dealing with the outputs, uh, with the outcomes and the impact um, uh, um, uh, uh, results levels as well. Uh, so process indicators basically are also referred to as output indicators uh, because they are able to monitor uh, the number and the types of activities that are actually uh, carried out. And um, good examples is like you can talk about the number or the types of services that you are actually able to provide. That will be a process indicator. Uh, then you will also be able to talk about the number of people that you are trained and that's um, a good output, maybe in a training activity. And so the number of people that were trained uh, will be able to uh, represent a good process indicator. And then again, also the number and type of materials that were actually produced and disseminated. Uh, also that becomes uh, another uh, good example of a process indicators or the number uh, and percentage of female clients that were screened. If you have a health project and uh, you're running a, um, um, uh, maybe a health uh, 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 clients are coming to visit a particular health facility, you will be talking about the number or percentage of female clients that were screened at the facility. And so it's important to be able to understand some of those examples of process uh, indicators as expected. Then there's also what we call results indicators, and basically. Uh, these ones are used to evaluate uh, whether or not the activity achieved the intended objectives or results. And uh, some of the examples that we are able to include here uh, will be, uh, for instance, and you can see now this is stretching towards uh, the outcomes uh, of the project. We'll be talking about um, what are the selected indicators of knowledge, attitudes, and practices as measured by the survey, or what are the perceptions of survivors about the quality um, the benefits and the services provided by the organization or the institution as was measured in the individual interviews. And um, further, uh, we still are able to break results indicators into two. And that's where we come to our interest uh, indicator, which was the outcome indicator. And you can see uh, the difference between the outcome indicator and the impact indicator is that the outcome indicator basically relates to the change that is demonstrated as a result of the program interventions. And this is um, the interesting point where every single intervention always want to come into. Can you be able to demonstrate uh, the change that has happened 
as a result of the program or project intervention uh, in the medium uh, to longer term. Uh, that is, for example, what is the number of decisions in the informal justice system of community X related to the violence against women that reflects a human rights based approach. So, uh, so it is more uh, important to be able to observe that particular change uh, for this kind of a project. And again, also uh, being able to look at um, uh, being able to look at um, uh, the whole issue of uh, uh, of this particular uh, program as much as as possible. So, uh, so it is good uh, so that um, uh, we are able to uh, be able to see uh, how uh, some of these um, 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 uh, how some of these differences uh, really uh, become uh, very very critical. And so somebody is asking whether do you think outcomes are under our control? The truth of the matter is that um, uh, you know the outcomes will not be uh, under our control. This is very very different from the process indicators. Process indicators are are, are in our control, but results indicators. I respect uh, are things that we actually measure based on the change that is actually happening uh, in the uh, 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 in the uh, in the in the beneficiaries that we are seeking to assist. So sometimes we are not able to um, be in control of the outcome indicators and the impact indicators. Uh, but you can see there a fundamental difference between uh, impact indicators and um, uh, being able to see that particular difference. Um, uh, of the impact indicators. You can see that um, uh, impact indicators um, are able to measure the long-term effect of program interventions. And uh, as you can see, uh, what is the prevalence of violence against women uh, and girls in community X? And um, we will be able to take uh, those percentages and see how the numbers changed uh, since we were able to launch this particular program uh, as expected, and, and it becomes very, very important uh, to be able to see uh, some of those fundamental differences. So, uh, so, uh, so into the course for Ebony, we are able to uh, delve much further into that, and uh, also just show you how to be able to uh, be able to uh, come up with your indicators, uh, assess them, and ensure whether they are able to meet. Uh, the expected uh, standards, um, are, they, are they smart? And um, those are some of the things that we are able to emphasize. But um, uh, for this, we just wanted to just give you uh, a snap view of the introduction of those um, different types of indicators that we can actually be able to have uh, in this particular course. And um, we want to move into another concept that we also wanted to be able to address. And, um, and so it is important uh, we can be able to uh, ensure that um, we are able to uh, introduce uh, quite a number of concepts that we were having, and that's what uh, we want to be able to do uh, in this particular uh, course as, as much as possible. So one of the other things that we wanted also to introduce was also the issue of m and &E framework. And I just want to talk about m and &E framework, but I also want you to remember that um, I will also be talking about the m and &E plan. And, and there's a lot of confusion uh, in the sector between these two. Uh, uh, if you go to some quarters, uh, actually they believe the m and &E framework and the m and &E plan are the same. Uh, so if you go to some places, you realize uh, that some people uh, don't see the difference between the two. But we know clearly uh, there's a whole fundamental difference between these two particular concepts that we find uh, in the uh, in the uh, in our uh, in our M&E sector uh, as much as as possible. So so what are some of those uh, fundamental uh, differences? Uh, let's first of all um, uh, take some uh, some some. Uh, uh, some some look into the M and E framework, and uh, we can be able to clarify what it is. Now, uh, frameworks are basically key elements uh, of M and E plans. So I just want you to be able to note that that an M and E framework is part of an M and E plan. So 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 you can't be able to say that uh, 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 an M and E framework is another name of an M and E plan uh, because there's that fundamental confusion in the sector. And uh, you'll always, um, I interact with a lot of organizations and a lot of m and &E staff. And you can always feel uh, sometimes people don't, uh, people are not able to 
note the fundamental difference uh, between the two. And um, uh, it is important uh, that we are actually uh, able to um, uh, see that particular difference, uh, that um, there are fundamental uh, differences uh, between um, um, uh, ME framework. ME framework is part of ME uh, plan. And uh, what it does, it basically uh, depicts the project components and the sequence of steps that will actually uh, be very, very essential to achieve the desired uh, project results. So, uh, so that's basically uh, what we are actually able to have when you talk about um, uh, the uh, the &E, uh, frameworks as as expected. So, uh, so it is important for us to be able to understand that. Now, um, then again, uh, also uh, they help us increase our understanding. Uh, of the project uh, or program goals and objectives. That's why we actually are able to have them. Uh, we are able to be able to look at uh, uh, enhancing our understanding of the goals and objectives of the program uh, or, or project intervention. They also uh, delineate the internal and external elements that could affect the project or program's uh, success as much as possible. And they are very crucial for understanding and analyzing how the project or program is supposed to work uh, uh, in, in, in meal and um, in monitoring and evaluation as well. So they are very, very uh, critical uh, in terms of being able to bring uh, that fundamental uh, difference uh, in the project. And so uh, it is important for us to be able to uh, understand them as such. Then again, uh, they actually come up as models, tables, pictures, uh, or maps that basically visualize the key factors that will be able to drive an intervention as well as illustrate how the project or program will be able to work. And in fact, if you want to really recognize the difference between an ME framework and an ME plan, uh, a framework is always in a tabular format. And um, uh, it is normally um, uh, something that is actually drawn to summarize uh, the key um, um, uh, steps uh, in which our ME &E, uh, activities are actually going to uh, be able to work. So, so it's always good to make that in mind. So generally, there are different types of uh, ME &E frameworks. And um, I just want to introduce this. And I think this is just uh, the thing that I would say uh, for ME &E frameworks. Uh, there are definitely uh, several types of ME &E frameworks. Uh, most of you uh, may have come through this uh, because I know you are uh, ME practitioners. Uh, there's what we call the conceptual framework and the conceptual framework uh, is normally uh, most of the time used in research projects. For some of you who have been involved in research, you will actually understand uh, that you will not be able to have a research project if you don't have a conceptual framework. Uh, then again, we have the results framework. And this is, this is the commonest that we actually use uh, in, 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 in documenting our results. And um, this is the commonest framework that ME professionals know. And this is what we call the uh, ME results framework. And this is particularly uh, where we, 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 uh, we turn our, fo our, our, foca our focus into because this is the one that's very, very critical uh, for any ME &E practitioner to be able to build, uh, to build up that. And then the, lastly, we have this one, you know, all of you know, uh, is very, very important in terms of project or program design uh, is what we call the logical framework. And most of you must have been able to work with a logical framework in one way or the other. And so the results framework and the logical framework really become critical frameworks that we actually work with uh, in projects uh, uh, quite, quite, quite a lot. So, uh, so it is important uh, to ensure uh, uh, we are able to uh, uh, look into that uh, as much as possible. So, uh, so it is important uh, to ensure that um, we can be able uh, to be able to look at that uh, in a very, uh, in a very uh, appropriate manner. So, uh, so we have those three. And um, basically, that just gives you um, a good approach into uh, what an ME &E framework is. And so, uh, in your presentation, you will find I have been able to attach uh, just a good, um, uh, what I would just call a, 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 an average example of exactly what you expect in an ME &E framework. And I'm sure you will be able to go through those details, but you can see some of the things that we are able to highlight. And this is a perfect example of what we call 
results frameworks. So this is a perfect example of what we actually call as a result framework. And as uh, you can see, uh, in the results framework, we are able to include uh, indicators, we are able to include definitions, we are able to come up with baseline um, indicators, target indicators, we are able to come up with data sources, we are able to come up with frequency, we are able to come up with uh, who will be responsible, and we are also able to come up with um, um, uh, what will be the reporting and who will be able to use that information um, that we have been able to, uh, to have. So, uh, so you will have that and you will be able to look at that. But let me just uh, uh, take some time also to introduce the m and &E plan. Uh, let me just be able to take some time also uh, to introduce the m and &E plan. And uh, the m and &E plan, and I would just want um, all of us to be able to understand, this is not a table. Uh, this is not a table. Uh, this is basically a document uh, that is actually prepared um, as part of m &E, uh, to make sure that we're able to describe the strategic information that our program or project will be able to gather and use to be able to make decisions uh, that will lead to the project or program in um, improvement. And so therefore, it is a very fundamental document that is able to hold the project or program accountable and it tells us whether the project uh, will actually be able to succeed or not. And so it guides us uh, in our M&E um, uh, processes and phases. So it's very, very important to be able to prepare this. And um, it's a primary tool uh, in M&E uh, planning. Uh, though sometimes we don't like giving a specific format of, for, it, for it because we know uh, people prepare it in different kinds of formats. But anyway, uh, regardless of the format that you prepare this document in, uh, then it is important to be able to address uh, some of these questions. So it's always good to make sure that you can address some of these questions, regardless of the format, um, define how, how your indicators will actually be defined, uh, who will be responsible for monitoring and evaluation activities, uh, how will m and &E activities actually take place, and um, another significant thing is how will that data that has been collected be analyzed and also how will the data be used in the organization that has been collected as part of m and &E data. So, so it's important to address some of those things, but we do not prescribe a format because different organizations will be able to prepare it in different ways because it, it acts as a uh, as a policy guideline for your M&E activities uh, in, 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 in your projects. And so uh, we sometimes don't want to prescribe the format, but it should be able to address uh, some of those uh, critical uh, questions um, that are important to be addressed. And then the other thing uh, that is important are, um, uh, was what we had indicated as part of our agenda, and we were able to emphasize uh, the whole importance of ensuring uh, that we are able to, uh, we are able to write um, an effective m and &E report. And, um, you know, when it comes to reporting, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of things that you can always consider. Uh, when it actually comes to reporting, uh, there are quite a number of things that you can always be able to consider. Uh, but then uh, what I want to be able to do is um, uh, out of the many things that are actually said about reporting or actually coming up with an m and &E report. Uh, I found it wise just to be able to uh, highlight for you the key elements, the key elements, because uh, there's a lot that we can talk about um, uh, in terms of an effective m and &E report. But really, what is the most key element when it comes to reporting? What are some of the things uh, that we should be able to uh, focus on uh, when we look at um, uh, the uh, the, the key elements for an effective report. And that's what we want to be able to address. Uh, so we want to be able to ensure that um, uh, we can be able to highlight uh, some of those uh, elements as, as, as much as possible. So, uh, so it is important uh, to see uh, if we can be able to address that and ensure that um, we are able to uh, ensure that um, we can understand what are some of the things that um, uh, we uh, will be able to address uh, when it comes to the key elements for ensuring that we have an effective uh, report. So, uh, so it's important uh, to be able to look at that. So one of the things uh, that we want to say is that reporting, uh, m &E reporting presents evidence 
uh, that a particular initiative uh, has actually been able to contribute uh, to the achievement of the expected results. So, so that's something that um, we are able to clearly highlight uh, in ME reporting. So whenever we come into ME reporting, uh, we actually want to be able to uh, address the fact that um, a particular initiative uh, has actually been able to contribute to the achievement of the expected results. And it's very, very important uh, to be able to highlight that. And um, how do we do that? Uh, then we need to demonstrate how the results were actually achieved. And uh, results really become uh, the highlight of an m and report because everybody uh, will be looking into that m and report to see uh, what kind of results um, have we been able to uh, uh, achieve in this particular project or program? And um, are those results actually uh, things that we can actually be able to, uh, we can actually be able to uh, depict uh, as much as possible? So, uh, so it is important uh, to be able to address uh, that as much as, as, as possible. So, uh, so it's good. Uh, to be able to have that and um, it is always uh, good to see uh, some of the things that um, we want to uh, we want to be able to address so uh, so I'll mention some key elements uh, three of them are key and uh, two of them are just additional uh, elements but um, if you can pay attention to the first three uh, then um, your m and &E reports should actually uh, come out in a very uh, uh, in a very useful way uh, for your stakeholders. Uh, so the first three are critical, uh, very very key. Uh, the the fact that you need to be able to focus on the results, uh, you need to be able to focus on how to analyze uh, your results, and you also need to focus on how to show uh, that your organization has actually been able to contribute. Uh, to some of the results that you are highlighting there. So, so it is important uh, to make sure that you can address uh, some of those uh, results uh, uh, in that manner. So, so it's always good to make sure that um, uh, you have a way uh, to be able to address uh, some of those results as, as much as possible. So, uh, so evaluation report uh, will therefore contain uh, some of those um, uh, key elements, um, that is uh, the results, the analysis, and also the organization contribution to these results. And that's what I just want to be able to, uh, to highlight uh, to all of us. Uh, so let's just look at the first key element uh, uh, where you need to make sure that you are able to report the results. You need to make sure that um, the reporting of the results is actually effective. Uh, that's a very, very uh, critical thing to be able to focus on, uh, where you need to be able to be sure um, uh, we, um, uh, we are able to ensure that um, uh, some of those things um, um, come out very, very uh, clearly. And um, uh, it is always good to make sure uh, that we can be able to um, um, uh, uh, to ensure that um, we are able to uh, we are able to do uh, some of those things as much as as possible. So, uh, so it is important um, uh, that we are able to do that and um, ensure that um, uh, we can actually uh, be able to uh, do some of those things and um, and ensure that um, uh, that is done uh, in a very um, uh, a very, very uh, important way as much as possible. So, uh, so description of the results uh, that has been achieved is very, very important uh, with reference to the current uh, status of the intervention indicators. And I think we have already addressed the issue of indicators uh, because the, the ones that will tell you whether results have actually been achieved and um, it is able to show the status of the indicators and how they have actually been able to change uh, from the baseline uh, as expected. Then the other component that we focus on is how you analyze um, um, uh, analyze uh, the report results. And uh, this analysis basically bids on the results achieved and basically also is able to describe to us uh, the results and improvements uh, in the indicators uh, that have actually been achieved. 
uh, with a focus on the work of the main uh, implementing uh, parties, that's the government, civil society organizations, and many others that could actually uh, be there. Then another thing uh, also that um, we need to address when it comes to the analysis of the, uh, of the reporting results is that we should also describe what were the, some of the shortfalls, what are some of the difficulties that were encountered, uh, what are some of the lessons, uh, that we are able to learn and how uh, have this uh, uh, been uh, or will they be applied uh, in the project. Uh, so it is. it also becomes important to be able to address that. And so uh, the analysis um, is a key component of the report uh, that basically allows us to be able to bring together uh, data uh, so that we can be able to make our story uh, for, 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 for the report that we, uh, we are actually building. So it becomes very, very important to be able to have that. Then it is important that the analysis uh, is able to clearly portray the achievement uh, to the reader of the report so that they're able to know what are some of the project achievements that have actually been able to uh, been able to uh, uh, have, have, have actually been able to be achieved uh, in this particular project as expected. So it's always good uh, to make sure that we can achieve that. And then again, also uh, reporting on the organization's contribution. And this is a very, very key element because it is not just reporting that should preoccupy your mind, but also the other thing that should actually be able to preoccupy your mind is has the organization actually been able to contribute uh, to the achievement uh, of the results uh, that are there? So this part basically uh, is able to describe the actions uh, of an organization uh, which have been able to contribute uh, to the achievement of the result as expected. So, uh, so uh, how has the organization been able to contribute? And sometimes we are not able to show contribution because sometimes we are working on the intervention uh, as multiple partners. And so maybe what we can be able to bring out is the issue of attribution. Uh, so remember there's attribution and there's contribution. Contribution is where exactly um, uh, we can be able to uh, uh, contribute to the results um, uh, using uh, also uh, in consideration of the other partners that are working in the same area that we are working in or actually attribution where uh, it is actually, we can authoritatively say it is us who have actually been able to bring out those results. And most of the times when it comes to uh, attribution, uh, we always want to do what we call an impact uh, evaluation uh, to be able to effectively uh, measure the issue of attribution uh, of the results. So it's important to be able to uh, note that. So, uh, so those are key elements. And um, the other two that I was talking about is ensuring that you make sure you understand the report recipient needs. And most of it, uh, uh, the reports that we do, it is always good to be able to bear in mind uh, who will be the recipient of the report and how they will actually be able to use that information. And so reports are normally used by report recipients or audience. Uh, to make sure that they can extract the most important information uh, that is actually needed by them and for their own work as, as expected. And uh, finally, we also have what we call, um, uh, we can ensure that we follow reporting instructions. So, uh, so also ensuring that we can follow reporting instructions is also important because most reporting requests uh, include clear instructions uh, of what is to be reported, as well as um, uh, in what uh, required uh, format. So, so that's something that um, we are able to ensure. And um, uh, if there is uncertainty on the content to be provided or the format for a particular uh, ME report, uh, it is always good to make sure that we request uh, further information from the donor or the stakeholders, and if appropriate, um, to directly seek that from the party uh, that is requesting the report so that we ensure that the report actually uh, follows uh, the reporting uh, instructions as, as much as possible. So, uh, so it is important uh, to make sure that um, we can ensure that we are able to have uh, the reporting instructions uh, quite, quite, quite clear. And um, uh, for some of you who might be relatively new 
uh, in um, ME uh, evaluation reports. Um, I think it's just good to mention some of the typical section, sections that you can have uh, in an ME evaluation report. And of course, it is good to make sure that you have an executive summary that highlights the major findings um, and also being able to refer the readers to the report body and also having an appendix mm -hmm. for details. Uh, then, of course, you will have an introduction where you state the purpose and the background of the report. Then, of course, you will also have a methodology uh, where you're able to describe how the study was conducted and also to be able to highlight any limitations in data and analysis. Then you have the findings, and this is where we were talking about where now you state your results, uh, reporting the results. And uh, this is the body of the report, and it is important to uh, present data. Uh, in a way that the audience will actually understand and selectively present the data to address the key point. And um, also conclusions is best uh, ensuring that you can tie back to your research questions or your evaluation questions uh, for the report. And that becomes very, very important. And then finally, you make recommendations uh, that is making sure you present evidence uh, that can make sure it supports your recommendations uh, based on the evaluation as well. And then lastly, uh, we needed also to look at this, and uh, this is where we are talking about um, uh, communicating m &E findings for action and accountability. Uh, what are some of the critical uh, concerns that you should always have uh, when we are trying, uh, we are attempting to communicate the m and &E findings for uh, for action and for accountability. And so uh, let's just look at some of the things. So one of the things, uh, it is always good to communicate our m and &E findings uh, to ensure uh, that uh, uh, there is action and accountability uh, of the project intervention. And uh, a meal communication uh, plan is therefore necessary to be able to have because that's the only way you will be able to communicate findings for action and accountability. And um, what are some of the contents of our m and &E communication plan? Um, it will, should be able to address some of these things. And um, in each of these components, I have included a key question that that component should be able to address. And uh, when you look at the target stakeholder, the key question you ask yourself here is who needs to receive uh, meal communications? And so uh, that is a key question that should tell you who is the target stakeholder for this communication that we want to be able to pass. And so, uh, so different stakeholders will have different communication needs and communication preferences, and it's important for us to be able to consider that. Then the other thing that you should address in your mail communication plan is information needs. Uh, what does each of those audiences want to be able to know? So, so it is important uh, that good communication should actually focus on understanding that stakeholder and their information need as well. And then thirdly uh, is the issue of communication methods uh, where we are trying to look at um, what are the most effective communication methods uh, that you should be able to focus on uh, or what are the literacy levels of the stakeholders and how broad uh, is the audience that we are trying to reach uh, in our communication methods that become uh, very, very uh, critical questions to be able to address when thinking about the methods of communication. And then uh, finally, the issue is, um, the finally is the issue of timing and frequency. Uh, the timing and frequency also becomes important uh, where we should be able to ask ourselves, is this the right timing and frequency uh, to be able to communicate effectively? Uh, so it is important that our communications are actually uh, planned in accordance and uh, with the overall uh, implementation, um, um, uh, project implementation team and calendar and uh, considering uh, when to be able to communicate uh, as expected. So it's always good to make sure that we can be able to do that. And I think it's also good um, uh, part of uh, this presentation I wanted just to include for you um, a sample communication plan uh, that you can actually also ensure that um, you can prepare this. You can see in this communication, uh, this um, uh, m &E communication plan, uh, we are able to indicate who are the target stakeholders, what information needs they have, 
what communication methods are we going to use for them and what timing and frequency do we need to also ensure that we are able to do for them and um, you can see there we have listed this is just a sample uh, case example uh, so we have the donor we have regional technical office we have the government representative that's the ministry of health the project team and implementing partners uh, the beneficiaries who happen to be idps and the host community members and um, we are able to uh, uh, indicate there the information needs that they have and also indicate precisely the communication methods that we are going to use and also what exact timing are we going to be able to dispatch that information to them and what will be the frequency. And so it is important to be able to, uh, to, be able to have that. And so it's important just to uh, be able to have that and um, that becomes the last thing that we wanted to look as part of uh, our agenda uh, items for this particular discussion. So, uh, so I think um, it's about uh, an hour and 33 minutes. And um, I think we were supposed to uh, uh, go through that uh, after an hour and a half. And so uh, let's just be able to uh, put a halt there uh, so that we can be able to have some feedback session and uh, questions and um, uh, we want to be able to see if we can be able to select um, a few questions uh, we may not have everybody ask uh, a question but we will be able to have a few questions uh, that we can be able to address and uh, make sure we also have a session where um, Irene is also able to tell us uh, exactly so so I think we can be able to have uh, um, uh, some uh, some 10 or 15 minutes just to be able to address a few questions based on what we have been able to cover for today. And then uh, we will also have another 15 minutes or so uh, just to be able to have uh, some explanation into more details about our programs and how you should be able to register uh, in some of those uh, programs as well for, for, uh, for further knowledge into this particular area. So, uh, so Irene, I, um, how, what kind of approach do you want us to be able to use? Um, uh, or, uh, Mr. Moshiri, uh, is there uh, a particular approach we should be able to use on this uh, as we take some uh, questions and uh, comments about the session? I think um, one, of, one of the best uh, ways that um, uh, would be appropriate, I think um, uh, if you know how to raise your hand, uh, if you can actually be able to raise your hand using Zoom, uh, because uh, if you go to where your name is, uh, you will be able to see an option for raising your hand. And I think I can see some few hands uh, um, uh, 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 lifted and uh, that's what I will, I'm going to do. Uh, at this particular point. So, so let me just start with Hamdi Hassan. Uh, Hamdi Hassan, uh, you can make your question or your comment and um, we will be able to see um, um, how many we can be able to address uh, just before we uh, give Irene an opportunity. So Hamdi Hassan, uh, if you just unmute your microphone, uh, you should be able Hello. to comment or question. Hamdi Hassan, uh, please go ahead. Hello. Hello, can we can hear you. Hear you. Uh, we can hear you. Just be, just be a bit louder uh, or move closer to your computer or your gadget so that we can hear you. Okay. What about, what about now? Can you hear me now? Sorry, my voice is very low. Yeah. Okay. I have a question regarding the accountability section. Okay. Okay, we just like when you are establishing new accountability mechanism for project in new area, what should you consider first? Okay, okay, okay. So, so one of the questions that um, ha Hamdi Hassan uh, uh, is bringing on board is um, when you talked about the accountability component, uh, in the uh, in uh, when we were able to emphasize about the meal concept, where we said in the meal concept now there is not just focus on monitoring and evaluation, but the focus on accountability is also becoming important, which we know is one of the key objectives of meal processes. 
And so Hamdi is asking, um, uh, uh, what is one of the critical things you should be able to consider, uh, particularly if you're implementing a project in a new area in regards to accountability? So one of the things that Hamdi should be able to realize, uh, one of the critical, critical uh, things that um, always be able to guide us is the identification of the stakeholders. So it is always important that you always are able to start with identification and um, your project should be familiar. Who are the critical stakeholders uh, of your project? And remember, in the identification of the stakeholders, the next thing that we do as uh, we have identified stakeholders is to ensure that we are able to understand what are the interests and also what are the influences of these stakeholders or rather what power do these stakeholders have. And of course, based on this, we have to prioritize the stakeholders and, and, and some of the um, stakeholders that we're able to prioritize through that process uh, is based on the power that they have in the project and uh, that is the ability to be able to influence the project and of course uh, one of the critical stakeholders that we'll always have the donor uh, is the donor that um, we actually receive funding from and so uh, accountability to actually be understood from the donor's perspective because this is the person who has actually been able to give the funding but then again, uh, this project will not only be successful with just the donor funding, but also the host community also becomes very, very important uh, to make sure. And so also as we analyze the stakeholders, we also realize that the host community uh, is also a critical stakeholder uh, in the whole process. And again, we are able also to ensure that um, uh, we have some accountability mechanisms for, for the host community. How do we become accountable to them? Uh, what is the best way to be able to communicate to them? Remember, most of the times the host community will not be able to um, uh, be able to consume information okay. that evaluation reports. And so you should be able to do the evaluation methods would be uh, important so to be able okay. to uh, include that. So, uh, so, uh, so it is important to be able to note that uh, so that we are able to ensure uh, that we um, are particularly uh, in a new area, it will all be dependent on the stakeholders that you have identified, you have analyzed, and you have been able to identify what are their accountability needs uh, to make sure that we can be able to provide that for them. So, so Hamdi, that will be the best approach uh, when you think about accountability uh, in a new uh, in a new uh, in a new project that you want to be able to implement. So, uh, so that's basically what we need to be able to do. And I hope uh, uh, Hamdi, you're comfortable with that. Um, I can see Hamdi, but I'm sure. Uh, Let me. Hello. Hello. Able to connect. Yes, Hamdi. Um, I was just giving you um, the appropriate approach. Uh, in such an area. Okay, thank you. It was very clear. Okay, okay, okay. So thank you, Hamdi. And um, uh, let's also be able to hear another uh, question uh, from uh, Ahmed. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Um, just allow hello. Uh, so that I'm able to mention your name, and then you can uh, give in your question uh, once you're able to mention. Him. Uh, so don't just uh, put video on and uh, speak. Let's just uh, be able to hear uh, your. Uh, let me just be able to hear your. Uh, let me just be able to mention your your name. Make your comment. Uh, so I've I've um, I've asked Anwar Ahmed uh, to be yeah. able to make a comment. Yeah, Stephen. Yes, is that Anwar? Yeah, yeah, Nagib. Um, okay, okay. From I am Nagib Ahmad from Somalia. Okay. And th thank you for your great comprehensive presentation. So I have a, a one question, which is uh, the difference between MNE plan and MNE framework. Ah, okay, uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Anwar. And uh, thank you. Uh, we were able to clarify this uh, in the presentation where we say the um, uh, an M and E framework is part of a plan uh, because an M and E plan we talked about a document that should be able to define uh, some fundamental 
um, um, some fundamental uh, components of how your meal processes will actually be conducted uh, in your project. And remember, as we said, uh, is that part of those components is also the meal framework. So, so it is important to make sure that you're able to know that, that, and, and that, that, that the m and &E framework or the meal framework is part of the m and &E document. Uh, but when now we talk about the uh, m and &E, um, uh, framework, we say this is just a table that summarizes exactly what are your results and what are some of the m and &E activities to make sure that you're able to monitor the results and um, uh, show us uh, who will actually be able to use that information. So it's a summary table that basically shows us uh, what are some of your key uh, results or key indicators and um, what are some of the many activities that will go into collecting that data, analyzing that data, and being able to ensure that that data is used uh, by certain stakeholders. And um, that's basically what we, uh, we said is, is a very clear fundamental difference between an m and &E framework, which is just a simple summary table, uh, whereas an m and &E plan is a whole document that entails uh, your meal processes for, 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 for the project. And uh, that's what we meant uh, anual. So, so thank you uh, for seeking that clarification again. So uh, I just want also to get a question here. Uh, let us see if we can hear a question here from Hello. Rehema. Stephen, uh, Rehema. Stephen, can uh, I Rehema. ask a question, please? Can, can I? Um, uh, just, just a moment. I think um, uh, allow to be able to uh, to be able to select um, your phone. Now Hello? you make a question. Uh, so, so please Hello? mute. Till we mention your name, uh, please don't. Um, uh, let's just have some some order into the question session. And um, uh, I know some of you are pressed to ask questions, but um, let's just be able to go in a in a in a clear order, and uh, we will be able to highlight that. Let me say this: make sure you uh, make sure you uh, you raise your hand. We will be able to see the questions that we are having. And um, uh, I was saying, uh, let me have Rehema Mbete um, basically make a question as well. Okay, not really a question, but I wanted to emphasize on what you said about accountability to affected population. Uh, what we need to do is that we, can, we should be conducting an assessment, especially during the needs assessment. This is the time where you have to identify mm -hmm. the extent to which the community would want to be involved the extent uh, to which uh, the mechanism, transparent communication and information sharing mechanism are identified, how the complex and uh, feedback mechanism and guidelines should be uh, identified, how community would want to, to participate in the monitoring evaluation. When I say monitoring evaluation, most of the time we only go and collect feedback from, we collect information from the community and also through focus group discussion, but we do not usually involve them on the evaluation part. How would they wish the evaluation to be? The strategies are to be used, the methodology. Then on the other part of uh, accountability, to certain accountability, we also need to look at their participation. How are we involving in their participation? Are we only involving in collecting the needs and are we incorporating their needs? And if you're incorporating the needs, are we looking at different uh, groups, uh, groups and gender? And also, uh, are, we, are we also, uh, are we also looking at um, incorporating their, their needs in the programming and, and so on? And then we also to, also to add in to strengthening on accountability, we also look, we need also to look at the organizational leadership and commitment. To what extent is the organization committed to ensure that accountability is being implemented? Same apply. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so development. If you don't, if yeah. staff are not well, uh, okay. I think we are losing Rehema, uh, but Rehema is making some very valid points in terms of um, how exactly to be able to entrench accountability uh, in our meal processes and um, uh, very very. Um, uh, clear practical ways that we can actually be able to use uh, to make sure that we are able to bring in accountability uh, as much as possible uh, in some of our projects. 
And um, uh, I just want also to uh, move to someone else. There's someone who here who was very, very pressed to ask a question. And this was, was it Akmal Javed? Uh, somebody here was uh, really, really looking forward to um, 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 be able to ask a question. Um, uh, Akmal, uh, are you the one? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Actually, I wanted to ask that uh, whenever we have to gauge uh, the awareness level of the people uh, with a large number of people like uh, 4,000 or 3,000, what data collection methods should be used and what are the methods to analyze the, those data collected by us? Ah, okay, okay. So, so most of the times when it comes to data collection, I think we didn't um, uh, get into data collection today. Uh, but what are some of, some, some of the things that uh, will drive um, um, uh, basically on uh, the methods that you are supposed to use is first of all, uh, the kind of information that we actually need to be able to collect based on the indicators that we actually defined. Remember, uh, by the time you are deciding on the data collection methods, you have already clearly indicated the indicators that you'd want to be able to measure. And so depending on um, some of those um, uh, indicators, uh, then you will be able to uh, identify uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the methods and remember data collection we have quite a variety of methods that we can always be able to use uh, for instance if we are thinking like what you just said you have a big uh, uh, population to be able to uh, to be able to uh, collect data from then um, you are actually uh, you are actually able to consider like uh, being able to do uh, surveys, uh, whether they are household surveys, you can be able to do that because it will allow you to be able to collect data uh, from large uh, samples and then um, you can be able to do that. If you intend maybe to be able to focus on uh, just being able to have an in-depth understanding of how change has been felt, you might be able to go into things like focus uh, group discussions and uh, you know, focus group discussions will always limit the number that can actually be able to participate. And maybe here you'll be looking at six to 12 uh, people. So depending on the indicators that you'd want to, to measure, then there are a variety of methods that can actually be able to tell you, um, um, uh, can I be able to be comfortable to get uh, data from this large group? And uh, maybe their surveys and questionnaires will be very, very important for that. Uh, but if you're looking into small numbers, then you can be thinking about, you know, um, uh, focus group discussions or uh, interviews, uh, just to be able to um, uh, key informant interviews, just to be able to give you information from small, um, uh, from small number of people that you might want to basically just get uh, in-depth qualitative uh, information from that. So, so basically that's what I can advise uh, Akman Javed, and I'm, I'm sure that should be very, very, uh, be very, very helpful. And um, um, uh, maybe some, uh, if you get into our course, we go uh, further into data collection methods, uh, which will be very, very essential uh, to understand all the uh, broad uh, categories of data collection methods that we, we have in place. Uh, so for now, I think I can see uh, Moshiri would want to- um, uh, Analyzing. Something. And uh, maybe uh, I'll just, um, uh, please note, uh, if you can just put your com uh, question also on the, uh, on the chat platform, uh, we are also going to pick all those questions and be able to provide some answers into them and we can still be able to send uh, responses to that, uh, to your emails. Uh, but for now, because of the interest of um, also looking at these other uh, part of the session, uh, let me just be able to allow um, uh, uh, Mr. Mushiri or Irene uh, to, to come in. So, uh, Karibu, uh, Mr. Mushiri. Um, Irene, Irene can proceed. Okay. Irene. Yeah, I can hear you. Please proceed on uh, the uh, process. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was a very informative presentation. And to all our participants, kindly note that there's uh, more when you visit our website. You can, we, we offer diploma courses, we offer certificate courses, and even postgraduate courses on M&E. So kindly visit our website and uh, enroll for these courses. 
Mushami is, is our consultant and he will take you through the entire course. And we are also offering a 20% discount to our participants today. If you will be able to join our course and enroll, we are going to give you a 20% discount uh, for our certificate courses, diploma courses, and uh, postgraduate courses. So kindly visit our websites and for more information. And we will be happy to have you around. So, and uh, finally, if you have any questions, uh, any question, kindly put it on the chat section so that Mr. Mushami can go through them one by one. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you enroll with us is that uh, once you enroll with us, we place you on, a, on our online learning platform where you, we are. Uh, the, web, the link to the website is on your screens. If you can look at your screen right now, we have info at capacityafrica.com and strategianetherlands.nl but I am also going to type it on the chat section so that you can visit it and enroll for our courses. So once you enroll with us, we will place you on an online learning platform that is an e-learning platform where we, you will be able to access our notes and uh, we have monthly Zoom sessions where Mr. Mushami will be taking you through the entire course right from when you enroll up to the time you finish your course. So once you enroll with us, uh, if it is a certificate course, you'll be, you'll be able to do it for three months. Diploma courses take six months and the postgraduate courses take one year. After this, we will issue you with the certificate and uh, we also have a research paper where when you enroll for a diploma course and a postgraduate course, you are taken through a research writing course. So, so for more information, kindly visit our website and also note that we are giving a 20% discount for our participants today. Also remember that you can ask your questions via the chat section so that we save on time. I know there are so many people here who would like to ask questions, but because of time, we will not be able to answer all of them. But we can continue this uh, conversation on our emails. Kindly write to us. We'll, be, we'll get back to you and then... Uh, you'll be able to join us. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I think I'll ask uh, Mr. Karegwa if he has anything else to add. Um, I know we have uh, Irene and uh, Steve. We have uh, 10 minutes. Can we take uh, three more questions very fast so that because I can see so many questions, let's take three more questions and then we can wind up. Please, please ask Steve. Good job. Uh, people with urgent questions, please raise your hand. <laughs> Can I come in? Hello. Hello. Hey, hello. Uh, hello. We can hear you. Uh, please mention your name and then the question. Okay, this is Chris from Nairobi. Uh, thank you for the great money for the introduction. I just had two questions. One is, um, um, they, you mentioned the five evaluation criteria, but there's an additional one which was added recently from the OECD DAC criteria called coherence, especially for projects where there's maybe some duplication. Is this something that... Uh, the new concept, as you're saying, MIL is taking care, especially coherence of different projects which are in the same line. And secondly, um, the, when you're designing new projects, sometimes the results from the evaluation are not sometimes taken into consideration. So I don't know what's your experience, especially when designing projects, so that we're able to really take care of the learnings and evaluation so that we don't make the same mistakes, because we see in project design, sometimes there are challenges. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Steve, Stephen Mushemi. I am Amor Hamdrable. Hello? Hello? Hello?
I take the next one, there's a communication challenge. <clears throat> Hello, Dr. Ahmed Robley, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's great. Actually, I wanted to ask uh, uh, that once we have gathered data, yeah, either by uh, focus group discussions or interviews or uh, anything, uh, any uh, like by using uh, by using uh, any method. I think so, if we can uh, if we can mute. Do uh, a bit, I just want to respond to that question uh, regarding the whole issue of um, the six components of the DAC evaluation criteria. And um, uh, yeah, it's true. Uh, there are six um, uh, evaluation, uh, uh, DAC evaluation criteria uh, where we deal with the issue of uh, coherence as an added component. Uh, but, but, but one of the things that you realize uh, is that um, the first five will deal with the the, the, the internal aspects uh, of the project. And that's why I was emphasizing them because when you want to look at evaluation, you would want to be able to see uh, how uh, the project comes out relevant, how the project comes out efficient, um, um, how the project also comes out effective. It also how the project also comes out uh, in a sustainable manner and um, uh, in an impactful manner. And coherence basically just tries to relate the project with the, uh, the, the external components of what is actually being done uh, within the same intervention area. So the uh, so reason why I picked that is um, I was just narrowing myself to just uh, ev um, uh, explain evaluation in terms of um, a particular project or program that you're running. Uh, but if actually I went into the dark evaluation criteria, I am so much aware that um, we need to be able to look at those six components. So I was just tying myself into uh, the internal aspects of a project or program uh, without uh, looking at the external components where we bring in the whole issue of coherence. And so it is important to be able to uh, know that. Then secondly, I think the other thing that you're asking is about why people don't utilize the results. And um, I think for now, um, we, uh, we, we overcome this challenge by uh, ensuring that we have a meal um, a learning plan uh, in the organization. And so we need to make sure uh, that we're able to tell uh, some of the um, evaluations that we have been able to conduct, how should they actually inform the next projects that we actually uh, need to be able to do. And some of the organizations that are effectively doing that, uh, but um, uh, evaluations are actually becoming uh, the basis for, uh, there, are, there are normally two, uh, two ways uh, to be able to go into an intervention. Uh, we can always think about replication. Uh, maybe we want to replicate the same project in the same manner. And um, the basis of replication that particular project intervention will always be informed by the evaluation that we did for the last project that we implemented. Secondly, the other uh, critical aspect um, that also advises a uh, new project intervention is the issue of magnification so that we are able to do an evaluation and consider if we are going to do this intervention again um, uh, based on the evaluation results, can we be able to magnify this particular project based on what we have actually been able to achieve. And so now it is obvious that um, our projects will definitely have to be able to utilize their evaluation results. So it's always good, but one of the best ways is to make sure uh, that a clear uh, learning plan has been put in place so that um, we ensure that we are able to learn from the results of the project as, as much as possible. So, uh, so thank you for that question. I don't know whether we can pick one more um, if uh, uh, Mr. Karegwa, you can allow, can we pick one more? Yep, uh, pick one more. Pick uh, we one can more pick one more one. and then we can be able to wind up. Um, no worry, I think even if uh, your question was not responded into and you have captured it in the chat section, uh, we will be able to uh, provide some answers to some of those uh, questions um, because of the limitation of time. So let's just pick one more. And um, I think we can pick um, um, a question here. Uh, from uh, um, uh, from Chris Masila. 
Oh, uh, do, uh, thank you, Stephen. I'd already asked my questions. This was. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, this is Chris yeah. who already asked yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, the question earlier on. Sir, let me uh, let me talk. Let me talk, please. Because uh, uh, you are already mentioning my name, but someone interrupted us. So uh, when okay. I was going to Anwar, ask you. Anwar, yeah, Anwar, yeah. Anwar Ahmed, yeah. yeah. Please ask. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephen Mushemi. Well, you are well-deserved. Uh, it's spectacular for your presentation. So uh, I have a couple of questions about the, uh, the garden of MNE. So I, I'm based on Somalia. So that the first question is, what are the essential skills or competitive skills that have any of MNE specialists before he become or have become MNE specialist? The second one is, is there any challenge of freezing during MNE process? How can you handle it if there is accurate for that any challenges or obstacles appearing during MNE process? Thank you, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Anwar. And um, I just want to uh, keep my uh, response um, uh, short because I think we don't have enough time. But um, one of the things that you have been able to ask is the whole issue of uh, what are the specific skills that um, ME uh, specialists should be able to have. And um, of course, there are quite a number of uh, skill sets that uh, you need to be able to have as an ME specialist. Of course, one of the very uh, key ones is uh, we always talk about the importance of you. Uh, having been able to have um, a, a basic uh, course like a diploma uh, in m and &E would be very, very sufficient. Uh, if you can be able also to have um, a degree or a master's degree as uh, you can advance towards that because the first aspect of uh, um, the competence requirements is of course you have uh, the necessary academics so or the knowledge on m and &E as, um, as a, as a as a critical area to be able to understand. Then secondly, of course, there are uh, skills that you built uh, based on your experiences where you will need also to have um, what we refer to as data analysis skills or research skills uh, become very, very important. And also uh, the reporting skill set also becomes very, very important uh, because uh, of course, you will be able to um, need to be able to prepare reports and also communicate the same results. So, so communication skills becomes very, very important. Uh, but what I can advise Anwa is just sign up to one of our courses because we still have this um, um, particular topic discussed about the key uh, competencies that an MP specialist should be able to have and uh, we should be able to give you some more in-depth information um, about that. And then, of course, in terms of challenges, yes, challenges are there uh, in m &E, and uh, we have quite well, few, uh, challenges that um, are able well, to well, even as you yeah. do your m and &E, and um, quite a number mm -hmm. of challenges. Some of them are context-related, uh, some of them um, are process-related, uh, some of them uh, will also uh, be based on um, uh, competency-related uh, and um, there are many challenges that are, can actually be able to uh, happen when you're doing your M&E. And it's always good to be able to look at the solutions uh, to some of those challenges. And uh, those are things that we, we clearly address as we go through the course. So uh, we hope, Anwar, we can uh, be able to uh, find you signing up. And I'm sure uh, you'll be able to get more details about um, uh, some of these things. So uh, thank you so much uh, for most of your questions we have been able to address. Uh, but of course, we will have this uh, um, um, uh, some other time, and also we will be looking forward to also have you, some of you uh, join in our course where you will have uh, much more time to be able to interact with us. So over to you, Irene and John. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve, uh, for the presentation. Um, uh, moving forward. We have, I uh, would like to invite everyone uh, for the next uh, session. We have uh, water and sanitation. Water and sanitation is one of the other uh, most uh, popular costs in terms of uh, the demand for services. And therefore, um, it's including uh, monitor monitoring and evaluation. Water sanitation is um, also an opportunity, one of the most highly paying jobs in the development sector. So we have this session running again on uh, Thursday. Uh, 10 to 12 a.m. p.m. Uh, Netherlands time. 
and uh, East African time is uh, 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock. So sign up and uh, you can send an email to info at capacityafrica.com or to info at strategianetherlands.nl and uh, we'll send you the link to sign if you'd like to participate. Uh, next week, we have uh, two training sessions on grant management and um, uh, on Tuesday, that is uh, Tuesday next week. And on Thursday next week, we have a training on uh, project uh, management. We'll keep doing as many courses as possible. We have a pool of about 200 courses. Uh, we will see how many courses we can accommodate in the coming uh, months. Uh, I want to thank all of you for participating in this webinar. We will continue the discussions. Uh, you know, um, uh, webinars are being used for doing business, but we feel uh, the development sector also has space to share information and skills. And so uh, Strategy and Excellence and Capacity Africa will continue giving you this forum. Um, I take this chance to thank our presenter, uh, Steve Mushami, for a great uh, presentation. And I want to thank uh, the technical crew in Nairobi, Irene Otieno and Nikki Bunei. Thank you very much, everyone. Let's keep uh, the discussion going on and the delivery of services to the communities so we can bring about change. Thank you. Thank you and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>